Thanks for joining us tonight. This is episode 52 of our Virtual Masonic Education a series entitled 21st Century Conversations on Freemasonry. Uh, you're in for a special treat tonight. Brother Jerry Johnson of Lexington Lodge Number 1 and the Rubicon Masonic Society has prepared this presentation. Uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, being a part of and, and, and hearing and receiving this presentation two times now, so this will be the third, and I, uh, I'm confident that you will not be disappointed by any means whatsoever. For those of you that are returning visitors to our education, we thank you. We appreciate your continued support and participation. For those of you who are with us for the first time, thanks for being with us. We hope you enjoy tonight and look forward to hopefully coming back again in the future. For anyone watching this video online, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and supporting us so that way you never miss a, a monthly Masonic episode of our virtual education. And if you ever have an interest in joining us live, you can RSVP, there's no cost, RubiconMasonicSociety.com slash RSVP. First, as usually, I want to give a special shout out thanks to the William O. Ware Lodge of Research, of course, the Rubicon Masonic Society and Lexington Lodge, number one. Uh, without your all's support, uh, we would not be able to make this episode or these shows or this series possible. So thank you to all the members of Rubicon and those lodges alongside myself, Worship Brother John Bizak, Dan Campbell, Alan Martin. Uh, we hope you enjoy this evening. Worship Brother Alan Martin, will you please do the honors of delivering an opening devotion? Brothers, let's pray. Grand Architect of the Universe, we ask your blessing this evening as we gather once more to continue our exploration of Freemasonry. We pray for open minds so that we may be better enabled to receive understand and apply new knowledge in such a manner that leads us to become better men and masons these things we ask in your holy name amen so mode be. So be thank you brother brothers and friends our virtual masonic education aims to help us to become better men always devoted to our family our faith our brothers and our country may we all come together this evening to learn to subdue our passions, to discipline our minds, and to improve ourselves through the tools of Freemasonry. Any opinions expressed during this virtual education will, of course, be those of the presenter or the participant. They do not necessarily reflect the views of any lodge or Grand Lodge or the Rubicon Masonic Society. By participating with us, you do consent to our full disclaimer, which can be found at rubiconmasonicsociety.com slash disclaimer. Quick protocol as usual, these are not tiled meetings. Masons and non-Masons are more than welcome to attend and participate. So brothers, please be mindful that anything said and discussed this evening should be suitable for Masons of all degrees, as well as non-Masons. Of course, gentlemanly manners at all times, no alcohol, no smoking, no eating, foul language, no discussion of politics or religion. In an effort to best assure that this virtual meeting is as enjoyable as possible, a few recommendations. We do appreciate recommended attire for each meeting being coat and tie. Please type your name and any appropriate Masonic title or location under your video. If you're not a Mason, please simply type guest after your name. Of course, please enable your video camera so we can all see you, reduce background noise, and avoid outside distractions in your environment. Brother, tonight's guest is brother. Brothers, tonight's guest is brother Gerald Johnston, and he will be presenting the right stuff guarding the West Gates, so only the worthy may pass. Worship brother Bizak, will you please do the honors of introducing our brother and friend? My pleasure. Thank you, brother. Brother Gerald Johnston was initiated in Lexington uh, number one in 2013. He was raised in 2014. He currently serves as the Lodge Marshal. He's assistant secretary, music director, and is also a longtime instructor in our Lodge Structured Degree Program. He's former chair of our Lodge Education Committee as well. He serves on our investigation committees, and he's a member of the Rubicon Masonic Society and serves on our executive committee as well. His essay, The Right Stuff, Guarding the West Gates So That Only the Worthy May Pass, appears in the recently released Transactions of the Masonic Rubicon Masonic Society. He points out that once a candidate passes through the West Gate, there's additional gates. Some are less obvious than others, through which men who are only worthy of being Freemasons should be allowed to pass. Brother Jerry, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Brother John, and thank you to the Rubicon Masonic Society for allowing me to present tonight. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can everybody see it? Yes. Okay. Um, so good evening, brothers. The uh, title of the paper I'm presenting tonight is Guarding the West Gates. That's gates, plural, with an S. Um, and as Masons, we often hear the phrase guard the West Gate, uh, which alludes to the door that a candidate enters prior to being initiated and instructs the brethren to ensure, to ensure that a candidate is worthy and well qualified before admitting him. Or like the title of the 1983 film about astronauts training to be selected for America's nascent space program, that he has the right stuff. Uh, the singular use of the word gate implies that there is only one gate and that once passed through, membership in the lodge is assured. Uh, however, it is important to understand that there are in fact several gates, some less obvious than others, that the lodge can and should use to ensure that only men worthy of being Freemasons are allowed to pass through. Before revealing those gates, we first need to define what sort of man we would allow to pass through. While this definition may vary a little based on the personality of a particular lodge, it does provide a set of core criteria upon which to base the concept of an ideal candidate. Uh, the first three qualifications uh, are uh, required by the Grand Lodge of Kentucky. It must believe in a supreme being, must be a man at least 18 years of age, and he must come under the tongue of a good report, meaning, of course, well recommended. Now, that's a pretty low bar to be sure, but by doing this, Grand Lodge provides a lot of leeway for their subordinate lodges to determine the best qualifications for membership into the respective lodge. Uh, additional qualifications that a lodge might want to uh, consider for a candidate, that the candidate should be an established man, quote unquote, that, that he should have a steady source of income and not be entering into a period of transition in his life. So examples of a period of transition be he's getting ready to enter military service, um, graduating from college, you know, new job likely moving, imminent birth of child and so on. Anything that would likely detract from his ability to commit to the work required. The candidate should be seeking knowledge and self-improvement, and he should be receptive to receiving such from Freemasonry. Uh, he should not consider himself to be, quote unquote, the smartest man in the room. Uh, the candidate should be at least somewhat philosophical and of an inquisitive mind. A reader is something more than the common and superficial. The candidate must get along well with others of differing backgrounds, viewpoints, political ideologies, and religious beliefs. We should look for more than mere tolerance, but rather a man who would be willing to call those who hold such viewpoints and beliefs a brother. The candidate must be a man of good character, since he's required to submit three references on his petition, at least in the state of Kentucky. Those people should be contacted to find out what they have to say. The candidate's social media should be reviewed. Uh, to see if there are any posts or uh, uh, images that might contrast or support what the candidate appears to be. Most lodges conduct a background check, which will tell you if the person in question has any criminal convictions. A uh, single DUI from 20 years ago is very different from a string of misdemeanors five years ago. The latter is likely to be more relevant. A candidate should have a willingness and ability to commit to the work required to complete the three degree classes. Many men like the idea of being a Freemason, but lack either the time or the willingness to perform the work required to become one. Freemasonry may be right for them, but perhaps not right now. A candidate should have a level of maturity required to absorb and understand the degrees and studies. A candidate should hold a valid interest in Freemasonry and not come uh, seeking business contacts, religious salvation, or nonsensical occult interest. The candidate should have the financial wherewithal to pay annual dues, degree fees, festive board fees, uh, and the occasional contribution to a lodge charitable cause. And the candidate should fit the culture of the lodge, uh, not only be suitable for Freemasonry in general, but the lodge in particular. So now that we have a model of the ideal candidate for Freemasonry, we can use these criteria as the prospect moves through the gates. Each gate should sort of act as a filter to separate the wheat from the chaff. So we come to the first gate. This is the initial contact a prospect has with the lodge. 
Now, this could be in person, uh, by email, website, telephone, social media, or simply dropping by for dinner for the first time. The brother who receives the initial contact should apply a rough filter to see if there is valid interest in Freemasonry and that the bare minimum criteria are met. There's no need to apply all the aforementioned criteria as these can be applied at subsequent games. In addition, the man making contact may have yet to see the value of Freemasonry that the lodge, and that the lodge can provide. Uh, a lodge should review its online presence with a critical eye. What impression would it give a potential prospect? Is it kept up to date or is the officer list and calendar from 2015? For additional observance or heritage observance lodge, does the website give the impression of such? The second gate. This gate would be the in-person visits by the prospect at lodge dinners, social gatherings, uh, perhaps a lunch invitation by one or more of the members. At this gate, you can begin to form impressions of the prospect and he of the lodge, engage his true interest in the craft. Attendance at multiple dinners, perhaps over several months, should be the norm. This gives the prospect the opportunity to evaluate the lodge and for the lodge to evaluate the prospect. By meeting with as many members as possible over this time period, it allows the brothers to put a name to a face when it comes time to cast a ballot on his petition. The questions to consider here are, is this man, or rather, is this a man you would be willing to call a brother? And how well would this brother represent the craft? The third gate. This would be a more formal plan meeting or orientation with one or more prospects prior to them submitting a petition. This is not the investigation that comes later. This is really an informational session for a prospect to determine if this particular lodge, lodge's culture and style of Freemasonry is right for them and to determine if they have the interest and commitment to the degrees and educational program. Ideally, two to four members of the lodge would be present, including officers and instructors. Prospects should be instructed beforehand to bring a list of questions. Attending orientation should be required of a prospect before submitting a petition for membership, as the orientation could be the first real taste of the expectations and level of commitment required. So I'm going to expand about uh, deviate from the paper a little bit and expand on uh, what the orientation might consist of. Uh, you'd probably want to have it at lodge that it, uh, on a night that is not a stated meeting night, just to avoid any kind of interruptions. And you definitely want to have the uh, agenda planned in advance and not try to wing it. Um, probably the first thing to get some quick introductions, introduce the officers or instructors or lodge members that are present, brief introduction of prospects. And what you're wanting to do during orientation, you want to sell your lodge a bit, sell the sizzle as it were, uh, before going into the work that the candidates would be undertaking. So you could talk about the lodge history, its founding, uh, did it play a part historically in the community? Uh, any famous lodge members that they may have heard of. Uh, you can discuss the events that the lodge holds, either for charitable work or just for fellowship outside of the lodge. Uh, you would want to bring up what the culture of the lodge is and its focus. Is it more charitable work, community events, education? Um, that way they could tell the difference between your lodge and another. And I skipped a slide. Here we go. Uh, if there's a lodge dress code, you'd want to bring that up. You'd also want to talk about what Freemasonry isn't. Um, so if they're there, they see it as some type of religion, um, if they're there uh, with some kind of occult interest, you would want to uh, make sure that's not the case. So you explain it's not a religion, it's not a charitable organization, although charity is certainly an aspect of, of the craft. It's not a political organization, business networking group, cult, and we're not the Illuminati. Of course, you'd want to talk about what Freemasonry is. Uh, fraternity of like-minded men seeking brotherhood and self-improvement. Uh, philosophical code of life. Freemasons must be men of good character and believe in a supreme being. Uh, you might want to take the opportunity to explain operative versus speculative Freemasonry. You'd also want to go through the petitioning process, um, explain uh, the investigation, balloting, uh, and then when you bring up initiation uh, to somebody unfamiliar with Freemasonry, they hear the word initiation and they're going to think maybe back to college days of fraternity. So you want to explain that there is no hazing, that everything is done symbolically and has a, a deep meaning. Um, you want to go through the degree work, um, you know, the stages of uh, entered apprentice, fellow craft, master mason, 
and the proficiencies required after each. You talk about the proficiency classes, how they function, um, how often the classes may meet, uh, the work involved and the time required for those classes. Uh, and you wanna cover dues and degree fees, uh, what they need to pay, how much and when. Uh, so that way there's no unpleasant surprises. And during the orientation, you want to allow plenty of time for uh, question and answers. Um, ask prospects what they're looking to get out of Freemasonry. Hopefully they brought a list of questions to ask, um, but you can um, you know, talk to each one and find out what they're really looking for. At the fourth gate, so they've been through orientation. Um, so the next step, if they choose to proceed, would be to petition the lodge. So any petition for membership requires a signature of two master masons who are members of the lodge, uh, again, in the state of Kentucky at least, and this is more than a cursory sign-off. The brothers who sign a petition are vouching that the man in question would be good for Freemasonry in general and their lodge in particular, that they'd be willing to call this man a brother and that he would represent the craft in a favorable light. And in order to sign off on a petition, one would hope that at least one or one or more one-on-one -on -one conversations with a prospect would be required to determine all of that. The fifth gate. This is the investigation committee. Any questions regarding a candidate's suitability for membership can be asked privately during the investigation. And of course, any information shared is held in the strictest confidence. A standardized question list should be available to members of the investigation committee to ensure that all pertinent questions are asked and that inappropriate questions are not. The investigation committee should uh, contact provided references, review uh, social media, and be informed of the outcome of a background check prior to meeting with the candidate. So to kind of expand a bit on um, you know, the investigation committee, ultimately you wanna answer these questions in the affirmative. That the candidate believes in a supreme being, the candidate is a good character and of sound mind and is an established man, as we mentioned before. The candidate is seeking membership in the craft for the right reasons. And that he's suitable for Freemasonry in general, and uh, this lodge, or your lodge in particular, that he would represent the craft in a favorable light. And that he has the time, commitment, and maturity to receive the three degrees of masonry and to perform the work required to attain, able, to attain a suitable proficiency. And that he would be able to meet his financial obligations to the lodge. Well, ideally, members voting on a petition in Lodge will have met the candidate uh, during the dinners and, and social gatherings and made their own determination. Many members often rely on the, invest on the investigation committee's report before casting their wider black ball. So this is a final step to determine the suitability of a candidate, and it must be undertaken with the utmost diligence. Um, what could be asked during the investigation uh, committee uh, meeting with the candidate um, again, you want to have a standardized list of questions, I think, to provide to the committee, um, explain to the, the candidate that any information exchange remains confidential and that uh, the outcome is only reported favorable or unfavorable to the body of the lodge. And the most important question to ask is why do they want to be a Freemason? And um, sometimes the, the candidate can't fully articulate why they want to be. They're looking for something in their life. They're not quite sure what. And at this stage, they're not maybe entirely sure what Freemasonry can provide. So you want to give them time to talk. Um, but but that, that is, I think, the most important question to ask is why. Why they want to be a Freemason. Uh, make sure they're, they're coming for the right reasons. Um, and why this lodge? Uh, have they visited other lodges? And what did they like or not like about those lodges? So you want to make sure they're good for, for Freemasonry and a good fit for your lodge. And of course, have they petitioned another lodge? Uh, which is probably on the, on the uh, petition itself, if they have or not. Um, you talk about, you know, family, if they have any masons in their family, hobbies or work, um, ask about personal charitable activities, um, see if they've read any books on Freemasonry or anything online. Um, of course, that can be good or bad. We've, we've got some great introductory books on Freemasonry out there, um, and there's a lot of stuff that's not so great, especially online. So you'd want to caution here about any misinformation they might come across, and uh, um, caution them against any spoilers uh, as far as degree work. You want to ask about goals they have set and achieved or any that they failed to achieve. Ask them why. Um, this can give you some insight as to um, maybe a level of commitment that they might give to things in their life and that might uh, translate into how they're how well they're committed to Freemasonry. 
you want to see if their spouse is on board with them joining. Uh, you don't definitely want, want to create any disharmony at home. Uh, some lodges perform investigations at the candidate's home, so the spouse is likely going to be present there. Um, that'd be a good time to ask. Um, if there's any concerns with a time commitment involved with Freemasonry, um, with the classes, the meetings, um, other events, and if there's any concerns with the financial requirements, you'd want to bring that up during the investigation too. Um, of course, obviously ensure that they, there is a belief in the Supreme Being. We don't want to del delve into personal religious beliefs, but you do want to confirm that and uh, see if there's any criminal record. Now, the background check will probably tell you if they have a criminal record, um, but if you kind of leave it open-ended, if your phrase is, you know, have you had any run-ins with the law, that could mean a lot of things, anything from a traffic ticket to, to whatever. So might uh, see if anything comes up there. So the sixth and final gate after the investigation, the sixth gate is a ballot box. A candidate for the three degrees of masonry must be passed by unanimous ballot, again, in Kentucky, uh, each brother present voting for the good of the craft. Now, hopefully, by since, but since by this time, the candidate will have been to several dinners, an orientation night, they've had two members sign his petition, and three more to perform the investigation. Uh, most of the brothers will have formed an opinion and will be able to find the candidate worthy. So in conclusion, when fully utilizing these West Gates, it should be easier to determine early in the process whether a prospect is worthy to receive the three degrees of masonry. There's nothing to gain by getting a prospect in front of an investigation committee who is not fully committed to the work, does not have a grasp of the basics of Freemasonry, or is too busy to dedicate a portion of his time to become proficient in the work required. By the same token, it is not fair to a candidate to be initiated into Freemasonry only to find out he does not have the time available to dedicate to the work required or that more is expected of him than he is prepared to give. Bringing men into the lodge who are worthy and well qualified and truly prepared to receive Masonic light can only benefit both the craft and the new brothers. And that concludes my presentation. Brother Brian, I'll, I'll stop screen sharing. I can hand it back to you now. Oh, perfect. Perfect. All right, let me take back over my screen share. All right, great. Uh, Brother Jerry, thank you for preparing that presentation. Obviously, uh, we were aware coming in that uh, it was a little bit shorter than most presentations in the past, but for good reason, because um, we want to keep this engaging for everyone that is with us tonight. We'd like to learn a little bit more about what your processes are for your lodge, your jurisdiction, etc. cetera. Um, and although these uh, six gates may seem obvious and perhaps basic, um, they should not be viewed in any way whatsoever as unimportant. In fact, this is the most important step of the process. And this education and this presentation tonight, Brother Jerry, is not only good for our lodges, but it's also great for any man out there that is exploring Freemasonry and might have an interest to, to better satisfy his initial curiosities of, of what this Freemasonry stuff is. Uh, what goes on after I visit a lodge, et cetera. And of course, this is not um, uh, specific to every lodge in every state and every jurisdiction, uh, but it does give a good overview of at least how we uh, stand to do it. So, Jerry, I have a couple questions. Um, I guess the first question I have for you, and if anybody has other questions as well, please type your questions in the chat box or you can raise your virtual hand <clears throat> and I'll call on you. Why did you prepare this this particular topic? What was it that that sparked your interest and motivation to prepare the detail of this topic? Well, I, uh, I've i served on a few investigation committees um, in the past where, uh, as we were speaking to the candidate, it sort of became apparent that he wasn't fully versed in what was required of him. Um, either the, the time commitment or financial commitment, um, and in my opinion, it, it proceeded to the investigation committee prematurely. That we needed something between, you know, the, just coming to dinner and talking informally with the brothers. Um, and we, you know, that's great. They get to know them, but there needs to be something more formal that, um, you know, prior to the investigation, because they get the investigation, you, you're, you're taking the time of the brothers performing the investigation, the candidate himself, um, only to find out. Yeah, he's probably not going to be a good fit. So 
Uh, Messler led to um, myself, Tim Aven, John Bizek, Dave Crickard coming together and, and putting uh, the idea of the, um, the orientation in, into play. And we think that's really helped. Uh, by the time they get through the orientation, they're fully aware of, of what's going to be required of them. And so that was sort of the idea behind the paper. Yeah. Um, from, so when you first joined Lexington Lodge number one, 14, I think it was, is that correct? Uh, 2013 is when it's initiated. 13. How, how has the process changed from when you first were initiated into our lodge to now? You basically overseeing the structure, the the education programs, et cetera. How has it changed and how did it get there? Well, it was, it was a gradual process, really. Um, when I came into the lodge, um, probably one of the, the first dinners I attended, um, I, I was given a petition. And, um, it, yeah, I don't think that it was an orientation at the time. Um, it was simply, you know, come to a dinner or two, you're given a petition. Um, I think it was a while before it was voted on. Um, so it was, a, a, honestly, it was a speedier process. Uh, the degree classes themselves weren't very different from what we do today. Um, there were degree classes. We had a proficiency. Um, might not have taken the amount of time that we do today just because we, we have additional material to cover. Um, but it was, uh, as far as getting initiated or get, getting ballot upon, it was uh, quite a bit quicker than it is today. So what led to the changes, in your opinion, that we now have, um, and how are those more important? Or would you say? I think, yeah, I think we saw some some members come in that, you know, they, they wanted to be Freemasons, but they just didn't have the time. They had work uh, commitments. Um, they weren't able to attend a class regularly. And even once they were raised, um, they, they maybe came for a meeting or two and then, you know, stopped attending. So I think we really wanted to um, make sure that when uh, um, somebody was initiated, that they fully understood the culture of the lodge, what was expected of them, and that they were going to be an active uh, participant in the activities of the lodge. In your experience, um, in your experience, Jerry, what is the knowledge level of a prospect when they first come to lodge? When they first knock on the door, they come orientation, they have some discussions on a scale of one to 10, 10 being obviously, say, Master Mason, or or at least having read a book, what, what knowledge level do, do you see that they have had? Are they completely green and, and have no idea what Freemasonry is or... What has your experience told you? No, not not what I've seen lately. Anyway, um, they have, you know, sometimes they have a Masonic, uh, you know, family members. So they are aware of, of um, you know, the workings of Freemasonry that way. Uh, sometimes they've read, you know, Chris Odap's book, um, Freemasonry for Dummies. Um, some have researched online. Some have uh, got friends who are Freemasons. But no, I I don't know that I've encountered somebody who's absolutely green has no clue what Freemasonry is but again that, that's probably dealt with um you know we talk about the gates the first gate where the initial contact so whether uh, at our lodge it's um uh, a lot of times the senior deacon that handles that the initial contact so they've already talked to him on the phone exchanged emails um, maybe pointed him to some resources so by the time they actually present themselves to the lodge they have some um you know some background on a Freemasonry Why, why is the, the first the first gate, initial contact? You mentioned website um, and other things. Why, why is that important? Because obviously there's probably a lot of lodges that don't put a whole lot of effort into their online presence. Um, we, we, of course, do at Lexington Lodge number one. And I'm just curious to know what your thoughts are on why that is important and how maybe other lodges could better utilize that as a tool for their first impression. Well, it, yeah, the website, and if you uh, you know have a Facebook page, social media, you've got to present the right image. If you're a more traditional lodge, you want to make sure you've got pictures up of the officers and, and coat and tie or whatever. Um, but the initial contact is really, you know, for lack of a better word, how you we got the crazy. So if somebody's read uh, the latest Dan Brown book and is all about you know things through Illuminati or whatever, you've you know that's the time to get 
either set them straight or make sure that they don't show up to the lodge and, and you know waste everybody's time. Um, and also give them a, a brief uh, background on, on what that lodge does and kind of get a sense of, of how interested are they. Are they just emailing on a whim? Uh, and we've had those before just, hey, what's Freemason all about? I'd like, you know, I'd like more information uh, versus somebody who is honestly interested for the right reasons. So that's really the, you know, the first step in determining, you know, who has some kind of valid interest. Sure. Yeah, I want to go down that road a little bit further. Um, so at our lodge, we have a website. Our website is connected to a CRM system. A CRM system is a database system where you can log into it. And if somebody fills out a form on your website, then the information on that form is inputted into this CRM database. Uh, and David Crickard, I'm going to call on you in a minute because I know you are handling a lot of that flow right now, just to give another perspective of this. But we didn't always use a CRM system out there. CRM stands for Customer Relationship Management. And any good business should have some form of a CRM or database management for them to manage their, their clients and customers. And masonry should be no different. Um, they fill out the form and our first step and our, one of our first processes is David, is we, we send an email and we try to get on the phone with this person, correct? Cause we want to speak to them. We don't want to invite them until after we've at least had a conversation with this, this person. Is that correct, David? Yes, brother, uh, you are correct. So, uh, we will get an email and it asks us to, uh, question, you know, what, what, why are you interested in Freemasonry? And, and sometimes you'll get question, they'll answer the question with a really odd question. And I usually will uh, reach out to uh, some, I guess, uh, wiser brothers and say, hey, what do you think of this? Uh, answer to this very simple question, why, why are you interested in masonry? So, uh, and they will advise me, it's like, yeah, this guy seems, uh, not a good candidate to go further. So uh, like Brian was saying, so I will end it right there. And, uh, but then do you have uh, the majority of uh, guys uh, or men who will sit there and, and you'll call them and they'll seem very interested. And it's like, okay, you invite them to dinner. They'll come to dinner and then they'll uh, taper off. They'll go, they'll, they'll just drift away. I think uh, uh if I would have been quicker, I would have had my spreadsheet open just to see how many uh, men have engaged our website this year and, as, and compare that to how many have actually uh, requested per, uh, petitions. We only have, uh, and if I'm thinking correctly, we have, we've had over about over 25 men reach out to us, but we've only had three of them have actually uh, requested petitions and come to come to dinner enough you know if they if uh, and the average i'm noticing is if they come more than two dinners usually they're more uh interested and will probably request a petition but I, I think i don't know if i answered your question but that, that's where i'll stop right there yeah you you did i think what i was trying to to get to is just the fact that we have a system and every lot yes needs to have a system in place. You, you can't just wait for emails to come in and email them back with some, some your personal email for that matter. We have lodge emails and we, we try to do it correctly. We try to treat our presence as if it's a normal professional business entity, which it is. Uh, so you have to have a system in place. If you don't have a system in place, then put one in place. And the way we have one is we have committees or committees uh, are in charge of making sure the system is in place and they report to the chair of the committee who then reports to the master and the officers, et cetera. Uh, and don't overthink this either. You just wanna have some form of organization so that way your lodge can accept interest and then also communicate back to the interest, simple pre-screening with a phone call. Obviously the person on the phone is not, um, is not taking the responsibility of an investiga investigation committee into their own hands. It would only be in a situation where maybe someone said they had a felony or something else is where we would not invite them to lodge based on the answers they've given. So once the once the conversation takes place and they do seem 
uh, at least interested and can hold a conversation, uh, then they we invite them to lodge, come in, meet face to face, have dinner, which leads to that next step, the in person visit. Um, would you add anything to that, Jerry? Well, I would say that the system doesn't need to be complicated. Um, you know, you, we've got a uh, you know database back in, but if you get as simple as a, an Excel spreadsheet. Um, but I think the main thing is to keep track of who has contacted the lodge, and if if they're um, yeah, you know, their interest isn't valid for whatever reason, um, whether it's, you know, they've got uh, some criminal history or, you know, they, they're looking for something that Freemasonry is going to provide. Um, still keep their name on the list and just note that um, in case they come back. Um, but yeah, just keep, maintain, you know, who's contacted the lodge, keep days in there so you can see how current it is and, uh, you know, have uh, and make sure there's follow up. So if somebody's contacted, reach it out to the lodge, whether email, phone or whatever, you know, after uh, 30 days, you know, have a system in place where you, you reach out to them again. And at some point, if, if, if they've ghosted you, they haven't contacted you again, just you, you want to drop them off the list. And yeah, can, you can, every lodge is going to be different how they handle that. Yeah, I think we have a three strike rule. And at some point we sent a final email that says if, if we haven't heard back from you, we're going to assume you're not interested. That's fine. Our door is always open if something changes and then we archive them and then we can always pull up their information again if need be. Uh, Brother Jerry, I don't know if you can see the chat, but uh, Piercy Jantz put a comment in and says, do you do you put the onus on the seeker or the potential prospect to maintain contact uh, or do we make a point to, to do the follow-up? And I think you may have answered that question a little bit. Unless you well, want to. Yeah, and the onus, you, you can follow up with them, but the, the brother, like you, you called him a seeker, or rather the, the, the person in chat called him a seeker, that they're seeking and, you know, they found the lodge one time, they can find it again. Uh, you don't want to uh, oversell, um, right? So you, you, you want to maintain dignity of Freemasonry and you don't want to continue to reach out and look desperate. So I would put, you know, follow up as a courtesy, but if, if they're, they haven't responded after a couple of times, Personally, I would just, you know, uh, archive them at that point. Uh, Brother Jerry, go ahead. First, Brother Jerry, I want to uh, really thank you for this terrific uh, presentation that, that you've made. As you know, from the fact I've given my talk on guarding the Westgate, uh, uh, on, on, on this series and, and my lodge like yours is very systematic in what we do. Um, it, it was very interesting to me that, that how your and my talk complement one another, kind of like a yin and a yang. My, my, mine, uh, was about the process, but yours and I am going to to steal from it like crazy as soon as my uh, copy of the uh, the transactions comes here. Um, your lists uh, are are going to going to end up in the in the hands of all the guys on uh, the education committee, which is who has this uh, thing at 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 our lodge at South Pasadena, and it it'll be very useful to us having such a well thought through um, checklist of the of the things that you should that, that you should get into. Um, we mostly have people approach us, men approach us straight ahead by showing up at our lodge. Very seldom uh, uh, do they um, allow themselves to be filtered in the way that you're describing. That would be great if, if they did. But um, all the more reason why uh, this uh, this checklist of the things to ask is um, is such a, a, a great a great tool, and and I thank you for it. And um, on behalf of my lodge, we, we we thank you for it. We we will put it into uh, into use uh, right away. Thank you, brother. Um. Jerry, can you talk about the in-person visits? Because that sounds, uh, and David, I'll get to you in a moment. That seems really obvious, but we have a system for that as well. So when we speak to somebody, usually we can we tell them to, when you arrive, look for so-and-so who will 
uh, give you a tour of the lodge, answer your questions. So we have a designated person for that step too. So could you talk about that briefly? Yeah, I think uh, as far as dinners, somebody actually showing up in person, um, you, you want to vet them beforehand. So uh, I, I think dinners uh, should be invitation only. Uh, somebody, somebody coming in off the street, so to speak, uh, I guess you could gauge them at the door, decide, you know, ask them a couple questions, see if their interest is valid. But I think really the initial contact should be via phone or email. And then you, you know, you vet the person that way, see what their interest is, and then extend an invitation to dinner or not. But yeah, the, the, somebody assigned to greet them, um, maybe show them around the lodge. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic idea. Mm -hmm. David, do you want to add to that? Uh, so yeah, I'm the, the designated like, uh, greeter, I guess, for the, the uh, Lexington Lodge one. And it's really simple. We, you know, it, they show up, uh, give them a tour of the lodge, you know, try to, uh, take away any of the, you know, the mystery of the lot, the physical lodge itself. You know, we show them our lodge room, we show them every, uh, you know, the whole, the whole lodge, you know, uh, and there's no, you know, try to take away the, you know, just to let them know that, hey, this is a, a, a good organization. If you're interested in this is we're, uh, you know, uh, transparent as much as, you know, possible by the, the constitution of the, of the Grand Lodge. So that that's all I'd have to add to that. that but my the reason I raised my hand is I sort of wanted to, you know, uh, pull a pin on a grenade and throw it into the room and see what how everybody reacts to this. But you know, we were talking in our lodge uh, about this not too long ago, and and uh, and uh, I said I said I would like to see it in our bylaws where we must do a a home visit because I think uh, getting to see somebody in their natural environment you will uh, be able to better, uh, I don't want to say judge, better get a, a feel for how that person is and who they are and how they live. So uh, in my opinion, uh, and I'm going to attempt to do it this year is to get it in a bylaw where like one part of Lexington Lodge one, you have to visit the, this person at home. So, I sort of pulled that pen just to see if anybody like is like, no, you shouldn't do that. Hopefully people will disagree with me. So. Well, let's, I think that's a great, um, that's a great point. Let's open that up when we get to investigation committee uh, number. I'm trying to go through from the top, but that's a great point. We'll definitely come back to that because I have some comments on that as well. Um, does anybody have any questions about step gate one or gate two initial contact what that process looks like, in-person visits, what that process looks like. Any questions or comments, or do you do those two steps differently? Okay, hearing none, Let, let's go to the orientation. Um, this is relatively new for our lodge. It's not something we have always done. We maybe have started it perhaps a year, year and a half, maybe two years ago. Um, and I think it's a great, it's a great step. It's a great addition to the process and worship brother Bizak, if you wouldn't mind, I'd love to get your input on the orientation process. What was the thought process to, to implement this step in our processes and what's working, what's not just your input. Well, the process, uh, is really what we should have been doing all along instead of just taking everybody who's interested in becoming a member and rushing them through the process. Uh, we have the uh, orientation on the first Thursday of every month when we have uh, candidates uh, to come and be oriented. Uh, we usually have at least three of our members there. Uh, Jerry and David have been there commonly. And we talk to each of the candidates in our library. And we tell them about the lodge, give them a Thumbnail sketch of the history of the lodge, which is significant for, for ours since we're the oldest lodge in Kentucky. Uh, we give them a tour of the lodge and we talk about the importance of a time commitment, which is really the whole crux of our 
uh, approach to filtering candidates today. If they don't have the time, why are they there? They can always come back. Uh, if they want to go to a lodge where it takes no time, there's two other lodges in our jurisdiction in our in our county. They can go to them or any other lodge if they'd like. But we emphasize that you you need to consider the fact that we take masonry serious at our lodge, and we want to have you devote the time necessary to not just be made a member, but to be made a mason, and that will require, and we tell them up front a minimum of 24 weeks for each of the degrees. And that, of course, depends on holidays and um, illness, um, um, periods when we're dark. But um, we don't have often classes that finish in 24 weeks. Often they go over. But we want that, that candidate to know that's the commitment we expect. And if they get into a class, the entire class moves along at the same pace. We don't leave anybody behind and we don't accelerate any of the processes. Uh, I think it keeps some men from coming back because they realize this is not a hobby. This isn't something you just join and carry around a membership card and claim to be a Mason. Uh, if they wanna do that, there's places they can do it. And I believe all the brothers on here know that there's places that can be done, but we choose not to do that. Now, Jerry, Jerry has a great presentation. I think it's the third time I've heard it too. And, there's, a, there's always value to it. So thank you for your time to give those perspectives tonight. But uh, Jerry's kind of a modest Mason, but he's been very instrumental over the years in helping us unfold this process as the culture of our lodge changed. And as the culture changed, we finally had a core of our most active and engaged members who said, uh, we don't want to make members anymore. We want to make Masons. So how do we do that better than we have done in the past? So we got away from the idea that raising Masons is some kind of an event. It's a process. And we try to explain that at each of the orientation sessions. We also look at our primary function is to explore Freemasonry. And if you didn't come to our lodge to explore Freemasonry, and perhaps you're not there for the right reason at this point. It doesn't mean later on when your time is freed up and you don't have as many responsibilities and you, you can't come to lodge, you can't participate in learning about Freemasonry, that you can't come back. It's, I believe Jerry said it earlier, it just may not be the right time at that moment. So I believe the idea behind guarding all the West Gates, as it were, is the culture of your lodge. Because if your culture doesn't change and your lodge doesn't agree that this is the approach we want, it won't make any difference. Uh, you'll continue to bring men in who don't have time for masonry. And while some lodges may want that for the uh, revenue stream in the long run, we know that the revenue stream, while important, does not sustain itself after about two, maybe three years of a man being a mason if he doesn't have time for masonry. So we start the process all over again. But orientation night is critical. Um, we can thank Jerry and a handful of other brothers who are in, intimately involved in our education program of uh, sustaining that and with the support of the entire officer corps. Each year that we do it, it gets stronger and the commitment of the culture gets stronger. So to just guard the West Gate without some sort of official orientation, I think, takes away from the rest of the processes, no matter how good it's applied. Thank you, Worship Brother. It's great. Um, would you want to add anything to that, Jerry? Well, I'll just say I, I see a comment Um uh, David posted that we we had 50 men, I think in 2023, uh, contact the lodge. Correct me if that's if I'm reading it incorrectly, David. But and three uh, requested petitions. So um, initially, you may say, well, that's a pretty low percentage, six percent. Only six percent requested a petition. But that meant there are 47 men who had some interest and decided it wasn't for them. So um, the lodge you know, didn't waste any time. They didn't waste time uh, pursuing something that wasn't right for them. And the lodge didn't uh, waste time um, 
you know, maybe perhaps getting them all the way to the investigation committee. But when you bring, and there's another comment here, um, uh, David, brother uh, Doherty from Ohio posted about uh, for others who've been uh, welcomed information about other lodges and who may perhaps not have done their due diligence regarding the West Gate. Um, whether it's uh, having somebody come through and get the investigation committee and find out that they really, in fact, weren't right for the lodge or a brother who got through the West Gate and you know, were initiated or, or passed a telegraph or even raised a master mason, you find out they're not, not right for Freemasonry. Um, it's, it's demoralizing for investigation committee and for lodge members to get a brother, take them through the degree work, you get instructors, um, you know, spend, take time out of their, their lives to help teach them the proficiency, and then the guy leaves. And so it's not just that you've, you've potentially lost a mason that's demoralizing for the members of the lodge, the investigation committee, the instructors, um, but that happened. And so, you know, what happens often enough, yeah, everybody's going to sort of lose interest. Well, why should I instruct this candidate? He's probably going to leave anyway. So you really want to do the vetting up front. Um, and so when, it, when a, a man gets to the investigation committee, when he's initiated, you know, you've done your due, to, due diligence, you know, he's right for the craft. Uh, and circumstances change. We've had brothers who were initiated, passed and raised, and they were good officers. And then, you know, they're young men, Life took him elsewhere. You know, we we uh, uh, have a brother who announced uh, last week that he found a job in Washington D.C. He's a young man. He's got a, a long career ahead of him. So you've got to accept that's going to happen too. But you, know, you really want to do the the work up front to make sure they are uh, going to be a, a you know a good contributor to the lodge. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great point, brothers. There's going to be a sacrifice by following a process as lengthy as this. The sacrifices you're you're not going to have as many members uh but the upside is you should have better quality members and and that is the goal it's quality over quantity i think we would all 100 percent agree and i can't echo enough what you said jerry about putting a lot of time and effort to help educate someone and then they disappear um so and the word sell has come up a few times uh, in this meeting and i don't think um i don't think masons we need to be doing any selling to anybody I think if any selling needs to take place, if we're going to use that term, is we need to be sold. The candidate, the prospect needs to sell themselves to us. We have nothing to sell. We only have value to offer and provide if they want it. So we need to re reframe our thinking a little bit on, on that. Um, and that's not easy to do, but I think it's important to keep that frame of mind. All right, let's move on to the fourth gate, peti petition signers. So... Jerry, this is obvious too, but why, why is why is this an important gate? I mean, tell me a little bit more about petition signers and also why it's equally as important, if not more important, for you, the one that has the pen that actually signs the petition. Well, when you're you're signing a petition, you're vouching for that man. Um, it, it shouldn't be just, and I've seen it done where somebody, oh, I'll sign it for you. What was your name again? Um it, it should be uh, it should not be a cursory sign off. You should be vouching that this is a man who is good for the craft, will be a good representative of Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, lodges should probably put um, the onus back on the signers, uh, perhaps use them as uh, mentors. So when you sign a man's petition, uh, vouching for him, you're going to follow through. It doesn't end there. Um, once he if he gets to the investigation committee, once he's initiated, you're sort of responsible now. Um, and in Kentucky, there's, there's two signers. So you're responsible for th those two men, guiding him through the crap, being his mentors, ensuring he's getting out of Freemasonry what he hoped to, uh, to receive, um, ensuring the lodge is doing its job um, to educate him in the craft. And they may not be the instructors. They may be, uh, you know, just they may have known him, uh, uh, you know, maybe a family member, maybe a friend that they've uh, introduced to Freemasonry. and um, but it doesn't relieve them of the burden of perhaps being a mentor uh, through his Masonic journey you know, to Master Mason and beyond. So yeah. I think that's really the level of commitment when you sign a petition. That's what you have to be prepared to do. Good point. Do we usually offer a petition or do we tell them that um, when you're ready for a petition, it's your responsibility to ask? Or how does that exchange take place? I think what we do now... Um, when they start coming to dinners, we, we explain the process to them. So 
uh, we've had brothers who ask for a petition and I don't think it's, it's really not so much handing them the piece of paper, you know, they can fill out the form at their leisure, but it's getting the signatures. Um, we want to make sure that they have been through an orientation before anybody signs that because it really the orientation is what determines uh, what makes sure that they are fully aware of the commitment required. Um, but, you know, you don't want to hand them a petition as they walk in the door. Right. So I think they, they usually uh, are told at some point when you're ready, you don't want to ask for a petition. You, you can get one. Um, yeah, perhaps before the orientation, but we won't accept it until after the orientation because they may need time to get references or whatever. But, uh, you know, the, the signer should be, um, or the petition shouldn't be signed until after the orientation. I'll, I'll say it there, in my opinion. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, I'm going to quick pivot for a moment. We have uh, two brothers, Brother Jeremy Patrick and Brother Roger Kurt. Um, in a few minutes, I'd like to call on each of you. So if you could gather just a few thoughts. You guys are in our Master Mason class going through it, and you're one of the most recent to have gone through this process or these processes. Uh, we'd we'll love to get your input on some of those items as well. So if you wanted to just prepare a few thoughts, that would be great to hear. Uh, Jerry, what type of questions come up about the financial aspect during the petition process? Uh, usually the most common question is they understand that there's dues. Uh, we're asked uh, what our uh, dues are for, for a year. Um, they don't ask, they're told. Um, you know, we have dues, we have degree fees. Um, dues are like the number one, 240 a year or 242, I think now. Um, uh, degree fees are, I think it's 75 for EA, 125 each for a fellow craft and master mason. Uh, and really, when you break it down, those are really nominal. I mean, the, the dues work out to 20 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times, honestly, um, they're surprised they're that low, uh, a candidate coming in. They, In their mind, they thought it would be more if they haven't necessarily done research of their lodges. Um, but that's a common question, what, what the dues are. Um, they don't know enough to ask about degree fees, so we tell them. And then when you get through the orientation or the investigation, they're told you know, there are certain charitable things the lodge does they can donate to uh, where they, you know, they can, you know, it's the right thing for them to do. Um, so, but the main thing is, um, you know, and also as an errand apprentice, even though they're not able to attend meetings, um, sitting on the uh, the meetings themselves, the business meetings, they're still required to pay annual dues uh, in Kentucky. So um, if they're, you know, coming into masonry, say towards the uh, end of the year, they're going to be hit with the errand apprentice, um, you know, degree fee and then their lodge due. So we want to make them fully aware of that. So again, there's no surprises. Yeah, I wanted to ask that because I, I'm glad you mentioned that the typical response is surprise that the dues are as low as they are. Really? Yeah. So listen to that. Yeah. Brother, you all, <laughs> you all need to hear that. We need to, we need to hear that because that's important because I, I think the, uh, the pattern is we are so afraid to raise dues because we're concerned that it's going to um, everybody's not going to want to join or everyone's going to demit. And I think that the answer to that question right here is being told to us that we're providing tremendous value. And as long as we feel confident in the value we're providing, we need to charge for that for no other reason than the fact that we need to pay our bills. So um, keep that in mind next time you guys discuss your dues at your lodge. That's just my, again, my opinion. All right, let's jump to the investigation committee. So th this is this is great. And David, I want to get to yours in a second. Um, my investigation committee personally in 2014, I think it was, was in my home. And I'm not sure, I think I might have been one of the last at our lodge to have done the investigation, to have had the investigation committee completed in someone's home. Jerry, was yours done in your home? Now, mine was done at Lodge uh, just prior to a meeting. Okay. Uh, and, you know, the investigation committee or uh, committees I've served on, every single one has been at the Lodge. We haven't done a single home visit. And, you know, to be frank, it was just a matter of convenience to us. Uh, sometimes we have more than one investigation in an evening. Uh, it's hard to get, you know, foremen together on, on an evening and, you know, try and work around schedules. But I agree that, um, you know, home visits are something we should start doing again. I agree. I agree. 
Uh, Worship Brother Allen, uh, past master of Robert M. Circle, how do you all, how does this process compare to Robert M. Circle's Lodge, and how do you handle your investigations there? Are they at home visits or in, in lodge visits? We've had uh, in home visits. It's been some time, it's been years. Mm-hmm. Um, they're typically held uh, in lodge. And as Jerry said prior to a meeting, it brought a, brought a smile to my face. I remember uh, my investigation uh, was prior to a meeting. It consisted of two questions. I was asked if I believed in God and why I wanted to become a Mason. That was the total extent of the investigation that I had. So it, um, I would imagine in a lot of lodges, it's, it's, um, it's similar. Of course, not, nothing's a hundred percent. Lexington Lodge number one, uh, I think is, is, uh, a, an example for others to, to follow as far as, um, setting a pathway for potential candidates candidates to uh, enter upon, follow. Uh, I think it it sets those candidates that actually engage and pursue Freemasonry, and it sets them up for success within our fraternity. I think the others that once they glean the information that is provided to them up front uh, prior to making them a member, uh, that uh, for whatever reason uh, that they choose not to pursue it. Uh, sometimes it's personal, sometimes it's financial. Sometimes uh, it was exploratory on their part in the first place to see what the craft is all about. Um, but I think the uh, the process that Lexington One has got um, excels uh, within our local jurisdiction and primarily with uh, uh, my mother lodge. It's um, it's not uncommon to see individuals show up at fellowship, uh, such as uh, Brother Jarrell was talking about, and it's not uncommon for those individuals to be given a petition at that same meeting uh, so that they can read it that night in our business meeting. Um, and it's just the culture of the lodge and changing that culture is is difficult. It's a, it's a slow, slow process, I worked on it, but until the culture identifies that it's time to change the culture, it will, it's just not going to change. But uh, uh, I think having that pathway, a, a thought out um, structured pathway for a candidate from the initial um, contact all the way through to the ballot box uh, sets the lodge up for success and it sets the candidates up to become successful uh, masons should they continue to pursue it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Mr. Brother. Brother Crickard, were you, was your investigation at home or in the, in the lodge? It was in the lodge. If it was at your home, would we have uh, had the same outcome? Oh, yeah, because you would have got to met my awesome wife and you'd been like yeah this guy's awesome <laughs> i hope so yes i think you would have <laughs> good point when my investigation was done my wife was with me as well she sat in on the investigation with me yeah who on here whose investigation did take place in their home does anyone all right would love to hear your feedback or your comments on that jeff would you mind How you doing? Um, you can hear me, yes? Yes. Okay. Yeah, um, John Albro, uh, 122 uh, Nova Scotia. Yeah. Our investigations are done in our homes. It's the senior warden, a past master, and then one other mason will go. So three people go to this investigation. Um, those three people will question the candidate for a while. The wife is actually invited in for a period of time so that she's aware of what um, uh, time constraints and time requirements would be required as well and what she can expect in, in the sense of social activities and, and, and that as well to find out if she's interested in, 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 in participating as part of that. Um, 
I've sat through three of them as the um, the the extra Mason person, not not as a senior warden or past master. I'm right now just going around the chairs now. So, um, but I found when we were there, um, our biggest difficulty was kind of describing the culture that they would get when they come in. I still find that when people um, come into the lodge and our candidates start going through, that sometimes they're, you know, oh, I expected this or I expected that. And I think that's something that when you do that interview and you're sitting at their home and stuff, that probably would be the best time to kind of convey um, what they can expect for what they put in. I mean, some people like to sit back in the in you know sit back in the back bleachers and just kind of watch things go by, and they're really quite happy doing that and not participating. Others are very much participation people, and I think that type of culture should be expressed to them as to what will happen to them or what they'll get when they get into that lodge. And that's something that I'm trying to work on now. Like I'm taking these notes like crazy. This this is one of the best lectures here for, for this type of thing. It's really, I appreciate being on with this one, uh, but trying to get it so that when I do get required to, cause I get called quite regularly cause I have a pretty free schedule with, you know, self-employed. I can go wherever I want to, when I want to. So I get called to go to these, um, you know, asked if I want to go fairly regularly and I go to them. I've gone to about three of them. Um, I think being able to describe that would really help our lodge in keeping people. Because if they people come in and they don't really know what they expect or what the culture is and it's not expressed properly to them, they get disappointed. They leave. They, it's not what I expected. But if it's told to them, you know, if you want to come in, come on in and like if you join in, you'll get a call every other night. We're doing something. But if you sit in the back bleachers and just kind of watch it, people don't call you as much, you know, and we lose Masons that way because they come in and they don't get what they're looking for. So I'm really trying to figure out how John Albro's culture could be conveyed during one of those things. It's what I'm working on. And uh, when we meet uh, once a month, um, we have a, 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 a period where somebody can get up and do a lecture. And that's, I have to do one of those this year. And that's what I want to talk about is, you know, this, uh, you know, guarding the West gate they're guarding it by creating a good environment so that the people who come in know what they get. And that's that's what you guys are talking about tonight. And so, like I said, I really appreciate this, but yeah, we go to the people's homes. We go there with three people, a past master, the senior warden, and one other person. The other person's there so that they'll learn. So as they, when their turn comes up as, as a senior warden or past master, they know their, their job find it works really well. It tells you a lot about a person when you walk into their home. And it does. Thank you for your comments, Jeff. Appreciate it. Oh, that's all I got. Thank you. Any other comments from uh, home investigations? Uh, I'll make one, uh, Brother Brian. Uh, mine was a home investigation, but it was uh, 60 years ago, and I had been at BMLA in that chapter, in that lodge for a long, long time. So... I knew most of the people in there, but um, I, I so often on this channel here uh, uh, brag about how well we are doing at um, South Pasadena here in Southern California, but um, this is not such an area to my knowledge. Um, the investigations at our lodge are like a black box. Nobody does knows even who the other investigators are and um no nobody nobody really has has any idea other than the master announced that the investigations were favorable on the other hand i've been on three investigations and on each of those occasions i have gone to the person's house now, with all of the orientation stuff that I've described before here, um, telling them what it's about and what they're interested in um, isn't, uh, isn't so much the subject matter, but particularly having their families there, seeing the kind of place they live in, experiencing the kind of, uh, of uh, environment where they're 
sharing their lives with their with their wife, their children, a roommate on one occasion. Um, boy, I think that 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 that's very um, informative and gives you such a, a more experiential uh, feel of what's this person's life like when they're not sitting there in the in in the lodge where uh, where I would ordinarily um, meet them and uh, I um, and I'll also make a quick comment on the thing about people getting through the West Gate. Um, the people now that are coming, men that are coming through now have to go through our classes and things, but afterwards they, they don't really have any compulsion to be all that interested in what this group here and I feel like the purpose of masonry is. Um, and, and, um, that that I think uh, bodes for our lodge being a a kind of a hybrid, probably for a long time. We're like 138 years old. Nothing like the uh, the the uh, Lexington Lodge Number One, but we've been around a long time. We're well established. We got almost 300 members, and there's a the, a big social side, and a lot of people come in through that route they get their they get their petition from somebody that they are acquainted with primarily through that route um and the only thing we really are doing is that we're putting them through a filter of coming through and being exposed to actual um study and and meditation and history and and all of those kind of things um so I, I I appreciate all the more the way that, that this discussion is going in terms of uh, me thinking about uh, things that we need to attend to here in Southern California. Great. Thank you, Jerry. Um, Brother Jerry, any other topics or items we missed regarding the investigation committee step? I'd be interested in hearing from the brothers uh, whose lodges have a prepared list of questions for, for the investigation committee to ask. Is it sort of ad hoc or do they operate from a you know list of, of topics to cover during the investigation? Maybe somebody can put a comment out there. Um, feel free to just chime in, brothers. So that means everybody has a, a, a list of questions in a script, right? We're all super, super organized. No. If I can, let me share with you uh, my experience at uh, my mother lodge. Um, initially, there was no formal uh, list of questions. It was through education that it was identified that that was probably a good thing to have uh, for an investigation committee to to give them some guidance and direction on on how to assess and evaluate the suitability for candidates uh, for membership into our craft. Um, those questions were developed. Um, I think that, um, or my personal opinion is, I think the questions are used most of the time, but not all the time. Uh, and if you're not consistently using them, uh, for their intended purposes. I think it has a negative effect on the backside in, in a lot of regards. Uh, the membership um, uh, relies heavily upon the recommendation of, of the committee, and especially if they uh, have no personal knowledge of the candidate that uh, is seeking admission into the order. Uh, and if the investigative committee um, it's not done their due diligence, uh, and then I think it has a negative effect. But we do have questions, and those things have been developed um, recently. Uh, I'd say within the in the past five years, so it uh, they're there. Uh, but then again, I I don't think it, they're they're actually adhered to a hundred percent of the time. But you know, I'm not on all of the 
investigative committees and and I don't, I don't want to talk ill of anybody that's doing an investigation because I assume they're doing it right but um I do know that uh, uh, the committee members uh, don't meet 100% of the time as a committee for the investigation uh, or whatever uh, activity has prevented them from meeting with the candidate as a committee. Uh, some of them have met individually. And I think if you meet on an individual basis when you've been assigned to a committee, then you you uh, dilute the the overall assessment that can be made um, on the back end of the initial evaluation. But uh, we do have questions, but haven't always had them. Thank you, brother. Yeah, I think, listen, just a standard set of questions, if for nothing else, then to get the other questions in your mind flowing, uh, the purpose is just to understand who it is that you're speaking to and, and pre-screen them enough to determine if you feel that they are worthy for your um, approval with the investigation. Uh, Mario, you have a good question. It's kind of a deep question. I'm not sure how to answer it personally. So Jerry, I'm going to kick it over to you. <laughs> how do you inquire about the philosophical interests of a candidate? Is it in any way uh, directed to the exploration done personally by the candidate on the liberal arts and sciences during his life? I think the best way to find out about any philosophical interest is just ask open-ended questions. Um, you know, what brought you to Freemasonry? Uh, describe your your life experience that brought you to this point where you're you're thinking of petitioning a lodge. Um, a question to ask would be, what, what books have you read lately? So that would tell you if they have an inquisitive mind, if if they're a reader, if it's something more than um, you know superficial you know, People Magazine or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and what books they've read on Freemasonry. Um, you know, if, if they've read Morals and Dogma, that might tell you something versus um, a person who's read nothing. Um, not that I recommend Morals and Dogma for somebody who's just becoming uh, interested in Freemasonry, but it gives you an idea of, of, of how deep a dive they're they're prepared to do. Um, but yeah, I would ask as many open-ended questions as you can. Yeah. To, to find out uh, how philosophical they are. Yeah, good point. Shouldn't, shouldn't the petition signers be asking these questions of somebody that wants to ask them to that, that that asks them to sign their petition? I know if I'm asked to sign a petition, I say first of all, you got to block out a couple of hours, have lunch with me, and we'll talk about why you want to be a mason one on one. Um, but I, I do think that the, a big part of that should start with the people who are going to sign that petition. They're the ones with the with the key to the West Gates. I agree. Uh, there's a lot of redundancy built in. Um, I tell somebody who's coming to the lodge for the first time, you're going to be asked the same questions over and over. Uh, mm -hmm. That's just how it is. So uh, the, the brothers signing the petition are going to ask why do you want to join Freemasonry? Why this lodge? Um, what are your interests? And then just general questions, work, family, uh, hobbies, um, find out what kind of man they are. Um, when they sit down um, and have dinner with the other lodge members, they're going to ask those same questions too. And of course, the investigation committee is going to ask them uh, during the investigation. So yeah, definitely. Uh, anybody signing a petition in order to, to you're, you're vouching for them, right? So are they worthy to join Freemasonry and are they a good fit for the lodge? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if, if they're a, a good man and a good fit for Freemasonry, but they really want to take part in charitable activities, if that's not the focus of your lodge, you should really refer them to another lodge, I think. Um, you know, they're not going to get what they want to do, what they want out of Freemasonry out of your lodge if you're focused on education. Mm -hmm. um, if they're more into charitable work. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's best at that point to kind of, you know, say, hey, you know, you're, you're, this is what our lodge is focused on. Uh, but hey, there's a lot down the road that really does a lot of charity work. You might want to uh, check them out. So. Yeah, good, good point. So again, I, th I think every lodge should have their own set of questions, eight to 10, you know, just have a standard set of questions that each person 
can begin with. And then, you know, let them go a little bit deeper. Don't be afraid to ask, well, what do you mean? Or can you explain further? Or what are you referring to? You know, go deeper into the answer of their question. At the end of the day, our goal is to make sure that we believe we can trust this person and want to build a relationship with this person. Um, you know, and I want to add, I maybe was going to say this toward more towards the end part, but we're guarding the West Gate. We're not locking the West Gate. I think that's important to keep in mind also. Let's let's not be so tough and egotistical in our pre-screening process that we prevent good men from getting in. So it's it's a part of really just trying to learn about each other. It should be, you know, a mutual enjoyment process to some degree, if you think about it. And that's my opinion, of course. All right, let's jump over to the ballot box. And then Roger and Jeremy, I'm going to come to you guys here in just a moment. Um, ballot box seems pretty obvious, Jerry. So my thought is um, one of the best ways to guard the West Gate, of course, is at the ballot box. And if you don't attend Lodge, well, then you're not guarding the West Gate very well on evenings when there are ballots. So um, I think the easiest answer is to make sure you're participating in your Lodge's uh, business. Um, but what, what else would you add about the, the ballot box for other Lodges? Or for well, a lot of times... A lot of times, uh, people who are uh, you know dropping the, the white or black ball, they're, they're depending on the investigation committee to have done their work, which of course they should have. Um, but really, as a member of the lodge, you should have taken the time to uh, sit down with that brother at least over dinner, because so I have to be a, a formal discussion and get to know him a little bit, so you can put a name to the face. Um, you know that's part of or one of the the West Gates. Every member is doing their part to make sure. Uh, that you know the, the man's a good fit for the for Freemasonry and the lodge, and um, you know they have the right if if they feel they're not a good fit to drop that black ball, um, regardless of um, you know what the investigation committee reports back. So um, because of that, you, you've really you know it, if you're dropping a white ball, you're saying you're agreeing this is a good man, but you have to have some background to say that you can't just do it on hearsay. Of the investigation committee. So when you see a new brother at the lodge, try and make a point, or not, I'm sorry, not a new brother, a new candidate, new brothers as well, then a uh, prospect or uh, attending a lodge dinner, take the time to sit down, uh, talk to them a little bit, um, find out what their interests are in Freemasonry. And that way we can do, it uh, comes time to ballot on them, you, um, you know who you're balloting for. Yeah, good point. So, brother, I like to sit down at tables at stated meetings where there are prospects seated along with a couple more Masons and purposely direct the the conversation to just those kind of subjects that you're talking about, Jerry, and uh, uh, get uh, them involved in talking about that sort of thing with uh, not just myself, but other other um masons that are that are in the lodge that's that's great if you can uh, if you can do it absolutely uh brother jeremy brother roger um really just wanted to get your take on this process uh, did you go through each of these steps step by step just like this uh were some of these did you guys go through the orientation i can't recall if that was implemented or not before you guys were initiated uh, what are your takes on this process? Is it accurate? Is it inaccurate? Can we improve? Can we change anything? Uh, Jeremy, can you go first? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, all of the steps sound very familiar, except the orientation. Uh, we did not go through that. And I remember thinking when I heard that you guys had created the orientation that that would be really good for the new candidates. Uh, after we were getting settled uh, for the EA uh, degree work and proficiency preparation that was new to me like what I wasn't exactly sure what I was getting into and at the time there were six of us and as you know three drop at, at different points and I can't help but wonder if that was part of it they they also weren't aware of what how much time commitment or what the time commitment would look like as far as the memorization and the proficiency work 
uh, maybe they did have an idea, but I know uh, I didn't. And even in the beginning, I was skeptical that I'm like, how, you know, this is, this sounds really difficult. How am I going to do this? But uh, I just trusted the process and the process worked out. Um, so I'm glad that the orientation is there for new members. But overall, I think, I mean, I remember when I first uh, sent the email and, you know, Brad Drew uh, answered my email and my call and uh, invited me to the lodge and he was very welcoming. So all of the other process was was very smooth and well organized. And I think it created a, a good filter because, you know, he communicated that I needed to come three or more times before petitioning and uh, I think that helps create a process where only people that are serious are going to take that next step. Um, and, and yeah. No, oh, that's great. Great. Appreciate your feedback. That's, that's great. Roger. Can you hear me brother? Yes. Sorry about my lighting. There's a remote here that I can't find <laughs> Get my light on, but um, I remember it as Jeremy did. We did have a Q and a that, I think was very valuable, but, um, you know, maybe, maybe not so much going through it, but, but certainly looking back, a lodge that's going to spend a year with you as you guys did with me before even allow me the knock on the door shows how much you value that next person. And if you're going to spend that much time, you know, obviously the nights of instruction, uh, Jerry, this was a fantastic presentation because the breakdown through there, I think, is uh, something that, um, you know, is, is is very accurate. And it's the second time I've heard it. And I think it, it does reflect on where our lodge is. Maybe the orientation is a new step that uh, we didn't have in the last couple of years. But we did have a lot of questions and answers. And I I did personally feel very valued by the lodge as someone that was interested in masonry because I knew that my time there was was being respected in terms of people willing to sit down and spend extra time, make sure it was right. That's great. That's great. <clears throat> you know, we spoke about this one at our last class, I think, about how you guys will be in that position at some point, guarding the Westgate as well, uh, should you become officers. So, great. Um, a few more questions, and then we'll proceed to to wind things up. Worship Brother Dan, I wanted to get your your input, if you don't mind, on a few things. And first, I want to set it up because a month ago, we had the Festival Board and Conference. And Jerry, you were investigated by the William O'Ware Lodge of Research. And that investigation probably took 30, to, 30 minutes to an hour, at least. Now, maybe you guys were just having some fun because you knew each other, but that looked like a pretty serious investigation. And you're already a master Mason looking to join William O'Ware Lodge of Research. So I'm curious if you could just give us your perspective of that investigation as already being a Mason. And then maybe Dan, uh, uh, bring it around full circle to just talk about William O'Ware and how that research lodge uh, handles their processes a little bit. Well, sure. Uh, yeah, it was a serious investigation. Um, uh, some of the questions asked were the same uh, questions that I was asked when I was petitioning Lexington number one. Uh, why do you want to be a member of William O'Ware? Mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, yeah, we were, we're all brothers, uh, but um, the, the same questions were asked and, and some additional questions. William O'Ware being a, a lodge of research. Um, but uh, um, Ultimately, I was I was accepted, so that's good news. Hope to attend my first meeting in November. Yeah, great, thank you, uh, Dan. Just wanted to get a perspective from a research lodge. Um, well, obviously, uh, to be a member of um, the lodge of research, you must be a master mason in good standing in another lodge, but um, we have the same level of concerns. Uh, a, will the individual be a good fit? Uh, can he be a part of the mix? And uh, and B, is he willing to uh, commit the time to uh, to the Lodge of Research? Uh, we have no interest in uh, in adding men who are just going to be a name on a list. Uh, if if someone wants to be a member of the Lodge of Research, we want to know that um, 
that he's willing to uh, commit to the process and actually uh, participate in the in the work of the lodge of research. Uh, and since you've been kind enough to give me the floor, I'm going to talk about the lodge of research for just a moment, if you don't mind, because I think there's something that um, that, that is relevant to this conversation. Uh, William O'Ware um, Lodge of Research has an ongoing project called Voices of Freemasonry, and we have just wrapped up. Uh, the seventh edition of that, and uh, the results of that are available, can be seen, can be viewed on the uh, uh, William O'Ware website, which is WilliamOwareLogicalResearch.com. Uh, this particular project is a series of 10 question questionnaires, and in the most recent edition that went out, one of the questions was, how can a lodge best guard its west gate? And there are, there are two um, things that uh, occurred in that particular questionnaire in that series of responses that I'd, I'd like to just bring to the attention of this group this evening. Uh, and, and I think they're both very significant and I think they complement what, what Brother Jerry has been talking about here. Um, and, and I will say that um, that, that, that this issue of guarding the West Gate is critical. Uh, it's certainly one that, that should have our complete attention. And I commend Brother Jerry for such a detailed um, approach to uh, the, the West Gate. But we had about uh, between 45 and 50 men who responded to this particular survey. And somewhere between seven to 10 of those didn't have any idea what we were talking about when we posed the question, how do you best guard the West Gate? So we have to be careful uh, in taking for granted that people know what we're talking about when, when we use the phrase guard the West Gate. And when we are teaching the importance of screening and vetting men for uh, membership in Freemasonry, we need to be sure that, that our membership knows in fact what we're talking about. That's a particularly disturbing uh, fact to me for this reason. Those questionnaires don't go to passive members of Freemasonry. They go to, um, to the more active and engaged members. And if we've got a significant number of those men who don't understand what the phrase guarding the West Gate means, uh, it's time for us to step back and, and look at what we are teaching uh, in general and across the board. And the other, um, the other response that I received came from uh, a man named John Cooper, uh, a well-known Freemason, a past Grand Master of uh, California, a noted Masonic author, uh, who basically made the comment, you can't guard the West Gate if you don't know what Freemasonry is. And I think that is uh, absolutely on point. And if we aren't uh, diligent in teaching what Freemasonry is, and as Brother Jerry alluded, uh, teaching what Freemasonry is not, it's impossible for us to uh, successfully guard the West Gate. So those are two things that um, that are included in the uh, latest edition of Voices of Freemasonry. There are a lot of other responses uh, that you might find interesting, particularly with respect to guarding the West Gate. So that information is out there and available, and I think it's a, a nice complement to um, the presentation that we've had this evening. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, Worship, brother. Well, for the sake of time, let's begin to wrap this up. Jerry, any final comments or thoughts you want to add regarding your presentation? I just want to uh, thank uh, everybody again for attending and uh, thanks for the opportunity to present. Excellent. Thank you, brother. Really enjoyed it as usual. Well, brothers, let's proceed to uh, close out the evening. Uh, next month, our presenter will be Worshipful Brother Alan Martin and his presentation topic will be the continued decline of American Freemasonry cause and effect. Uh, Worship Brother Allen, would you give us maybe a 60-second soapbox pitch about what we can expect next month? Would you mind? Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm going to present uh, my perspective on what I believe to be the um, fundamental uh, influential cause uh, that spearheaded the decline of Freemasonry over the past six decades, um, and we'll discuss, uh, again, guard, guarding the West Gate. Jerry, excellent uh, presentation tonight. 
um, I will give eight, uh, seven to eight reasons uh, why I believe Freemasonry will continue to decline um, over the next seven years and well into the 2030s. Uh, I will also give an opposing um, six to seven, maybe eight reasons why the fraternity uh, will continue to survive, even though we will realize a significant decline over the next seven years uh, and what the fraternity will will look like uh, after that decline uh, seems to um, remove those that are uninterested in in our membership roles. So it will be about uh, errors of the past, how they've influenced what we're doing today and how what we're doing today will continue to lead to further decline of our fraternity. Great. Look forward to it very much. That meeting again is October 23rd, Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, for those of you that were able to join us, we recently had a festival board and conference, and there's been many requests for the photos of that event. And you can go to RubiconMasonicSociety.com slash photos. And on that page, you'll be able to click a link to take you to the photos of the festival board. And just wanted to get the input of uh, one of our brothers, uh, Jeremiah Beaver. Uh, I believe that was your first festive board. Just any any thoughts about it you want to share? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I, uh, Jeremiah Beaver, newly raised Master Mason, Broad Ripple, number 643 in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, I, it was excellent. I, I didn't know... I didn't know anybody there, but I knew I've, I've watched the Rubicon, a lot of these lectures on YouTube. So it's my first live one. Um, but then I, I heard about it and um, I'm really interested in, especially Indiana Masonic history. And of course, um, Brother Hodap and Dwight Smith and, um, you know, just the caliber of speakers there. I was something I was like, oh, I have to have to go to this and. I did and it was it was wonderful it was um informative and shed a lot of light on on authors some some authors authors that were being discussed I was well aware of some I had no idea who they were um but I really got a lot out of it I appreciate the attention and attention to detail and effort that went into it and the um audio and video visual elements and production um yeah it was excellent oh and thank you for having um uh books <laughs> thanks for having the books there to buy because a lot of that well transactions was brand new so i, I grabbed that and um um the kind of uh you know fancy edition of um of brother hammers observing the craft things like that so i i uh spent spent a little bit too much money but that was okay and um yeah it was, it was excellent and wonderful and i'll i'll be there next year thank you it was great to meet you great to see you I look forward to next year and on that note for anybody that wasn't able to attend we did uh record the production we are working on uh, an edited piece of that uh, for sale, and we will let you know when that is completed. Also, the transactions, as were just mentioned, are finally available. They're out, available for purchase. You can go to Amazon and search Rubicon Transactions, or you can go to rubiconmasoniccsociety.com slash transactions, and we'll get you the link there as well. Uh, buy a bunch of copies because all of it goes to Rubicon, which is a nonprofit organization. Worship Brother Bizak, would you give a brief um, a snippet about our friends, the Philalethes Society, please? Certainly. Brothers, the Philalethes Society was founded in uh, 1928, and today it's an international Masonic Research Society and the oldest independent Masonic Research Society in North America. It was started uh, to serve the needs of those who sought a deeper insight 
and our history, uh, our rituals and symbols, uh, as well as just spreading Masonic light. You can learn more about Philalethes by following the link that's on the screen, and I'll post that link uh, this evening before we sign off. And if you have any questions, please get in touch with me. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, Worship, brother. Uh, brother David Crickard, will you have VHS copies? Absolutely not. Uh, and on that topic, <clears throat> uh, if you do want to spend more money with Rubicon, we will happily accept it. Again, it goes to our nonprofit organization. The Masonic Table is a documentary. Uh, go check it out if you haven't already. And those circle discs are available as well if you need one. And if you are feeling charitable as well, uh, please feel free to donate rubiconmasonicsociety.com slash donate. Are there any final comments from anyone on the floor before we proceed to close? I'll make one. Jerry, thank you. Outstanding. Really appreciate your time. Uh, every time I hear this presentation, I get something else out of it. So this is an extremely important topic. Thank you. Thank you, brother. And Worship Brother Chaplain, would you please do the honors of delivering a closing devotion? Yeah, absolutely. Grand Architect of the Universe, as we now prepare to close our time together this evening, we pray that you will endue us with the competency of your divine wisdom that we may be better enabled to conduct our lives as just and upright men and masons. We ask that you guide our thoughts and actions, fortifying every moral virtue within us, granting us the necessary strength and wisdom and courage as we endeavor to work for your great purposes through masonry. These things we ask in your holy name. Amen. So mote it be. So mote it be. Brothers, thank you all for joining us. <clears throat> Our next meeting is uh, not September 25th, 2023. It's October 23rd, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. RSVP at rubiconmasonicsociety.com slash RSVP. Uh, no need to re-sign up or RSVP if you're already on the list. You'll get a link. Brothers, thanks for uh, recharging my batteries once a month with Freemasonry, and I hope that the Rubicon Masonic Society continues to recharge yours. So appreciate what you do for our great fraternity. Have a great night. We'll see you soon. <laughs>